Welcome to the webinar on housing committees as a tool to meet local needs. I can see attendees are rolling in. And we're so thankful that you are giving us an hour and a half of your time on a Friday afternoon. As you arrive, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat function by posting your name, organization, and, and or town. This gathering is a collaboration between DHCD, the Champlain Valley uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and local leaders and advocates like you. Presenting today, we have just such an impressive group of individuals who are passionate about what it means to have a home, a place that keeps you safe, dry, secure, and offers you a foundation for work, leisure, and community places that have really taken on even more meaning in our lives since March. We've teamed up today because we have seen how local housing communities, committees can be a transformative tool to address housing needs and promote equal housing opportunities in towns and cities of all sizes. Whether a municipally supported committee, subcommittee of the planning commission, resident advocacy group, housing discussion meetup, or any other group that seeks to support or change the quality, quantity, affordability, and inclusiveness of a housing in a community. Sean Gilpin, DHCD's housing program manager, is going to offer a snapshot of the housing landscape in the wake of COVID. I, Jacob Hemrick, planning policy manager at the Department of Housing and Community Development, I'm going to talk about the regulatory and planning landscape we see at the state, uh, followed by Jess Hyman, the Fair Housing Project Director at CVOEO, who will offer an overview of housing committees and lead a panel discussion uh, of local leaders working on housing issues, uh, including Pam Brangan of Shel Shelburne, Darren Schibler of Essex, Heather Carrington of Winooski, Janet Hurley of Manchester, and Carl Bolin of Heinsberg. Finally, we're so lucky to have Leslie Black Plumo, Community Relations and Research Manager at VHFA to talk about tools to help housing com communities. After our presentations and panel discussion, We'll end with questions and answers. I also need to thank Jenny Lavoy of DHCD, who is our webinar guru working behind the scenes. Please let us know if you're having any difficulties in the chat functions. Participants will remain muted throughout the session, and we ask that you use the question function instead of raising your hand, uh, which you should, should see in a drop down uh, uh, toolbar on your right. Once again, if you signed in a little late, we invite you to post your name and organization or town in the chat so everyone has a better sense of who's sharing this digital space together. With that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Sean Gilpin, DHCD's Housing Program Manager. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Jacob, for that introduction. Um, again, Sean Gilpin with the Housing Division of the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I uh, just want to give a little little context and sort of table setting, if you will, and uh, recognize that risk that I might very well be uh, preaching to the choir about the importance of housing and why, why we're all here talking about um, housing um, and the interest in housing committees in our local um, in our local context. And I think probably everybody on the call recognizes that housing is really a platform for uh, pretty much every aspect of one's life. I think we all recognize that um, there's obvious health benefits to having um, healthy housing. It's, uh, it dictates what neighborhoods uh, people are uh, people are interacting in, the, the local, the neighbors that they're interacting with, access to education and jobs, um, and even some more of the abstract things like exposure to environmental hazards, um, exposure to the potential for crime and just the stability of housing obviously has huge effects on every aspect of our life and uh, for better or worse especially in the united states uh, housing tends to be one of the tools for generational wealth development um, it's much much more than just your income housing is often especially in home ownership situations is often uh, the most expensive asset that uh, americans invest in uh, it's a platform through which um, people can leverage equity in order to access higher education, um, to pass on generational wealth, uh, and numerous other things that, that have benefits. And uh, housing that's affordable, uh, rental or homeowner, is essential in order to have um, those benefits actually be realized. And we also know, um, since you know this is uh, an important topic and uh, this 
conversation is happening in collaboration with CVOEO's Fair Housing Project that housing discrimination and access to housing uh, for all people is incredibly affected by general availability. You know, fortunately, uh, over the last decades in this country, we've we've made significant progress away from what used to be historically rather explicit discriminator discriminatory policies when it came to housing development and housing access from things like redlining, whereby uh, certain people of certain colors, origins, or races were not allowed or not um, given financing to uh, purchase or uh, develop housing in certain areas. Um, to we've moved away from that uh, with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, um, but still certainly experience a lot of implicit uh, housing discrimination. And we know that in a tight housing market where availability and affordability are low, it's much easier to uh, it's much easier to see housing discrimination engaged with what uh, we typically call um, a, a handshake and a smile, as opposed to the more explicit discrimination that used to happen in our nation's history. That um, that is something that definitely still exists in Vermont. Um, we still know that there are there are racial discrimination issues, but there's also discrimination against um, families with children and people with disabilities, and all of that is is uh, more difficult to address when the housing availability is low. In Vermont generally, uh, we know that we have an older housing stock. Uh, nearly 60% of our housing units were built before the year 1980. Um, and we also have a large housing stock. Um, again, about 60% of the housing units in Vermont are three or more bedrooms. And as we see uh, an aging population, we've talked about that um, a lot in, in the state over the last few years, and also the interest in attracting uh, younger, uh, younger cohorts, typically smaller families, means that we're going to need to address both of the issues of, of aging housing and also housing that's, that's oversized. Um, and that's especially true, I think, in places where we've designated um, for growth areas, our downtowns, our village centers, um, places that are closer to services and social interactions um, tend to be, studies show the areas that are most attractive, both to an aging population that's looking to downsize and still live within the community, uh, as well as sort of young folks who are trying to, to come in and, and leave, leave mom and dad's place and, and venture out on their own. So we also know that this is putting an increased pressure on those very areas and in fact is adding to um, adding to housing cost burdens. Uh, we know that Vermont is similar to the rest of the nation whereby we're seeing increased living, living costs while wages generally are not increasing at the same rate or in many cases are actually stagnant. Uh, over the last couple of years. In fact, a recent report came out um, from the National Low Income Housing Coalition uh, that indicated that for, um, for an individual or a household, I should say, in Vermont to be able to afford a modest two bedroom apartment, they need to be making $23.36 per hour on a statewide level. Uh, this obviously varies county to county and the Burlington Metropolitan Statistical Area for the first time ever has exceeded $30 per hour uh, housing wage in order to afford a two bedroom apartment without spending more than 30% of your income on housing. Uh, because of that, we know that 50% of the renters in Vermont are considered housing cost burden, spending more than 30% of that amount on their housing. And of that 25%, fully half of those housing cost um, burdened households are actually spending 50% or more of their income. Uh, the similar statistics for homeowners is 29% spending more than a third of their income on housing costs. And of that 12% are at the severely cost burden um, rate spending more than 50% of their income on housing. And we know that that has really deleterious effects on people's ability to be upwardly mobile and frankly, just uh, individual day-to-day -day health uh, when it comes to uh, feeling financial security and the things and uh, the actual physical ailments that can be associated with being financially insecure and the stress of having to move place to place uh, in order to avoid unaffordable situations. 
all of this was known before uh, the pandemic came um, to our shores um, and we were well aware of these issues, but a lot of things have, have um, really been revealed by COVID-19, not least of which all of these underlying problems. Um, it really has underscored the precarious situation that so many people are in where um, missing one or two paychecks could put you at significant risk of eviction or foreclosure. And this has all come to a head at the same time that we are uh, seeing uh, rightfully a growing, um, a growing movement uh, for support of Black Lives Matter and against the systemic racism and police brutality. I've really underscored a lot of uh, the long-term effects of those historic discriminatory practices that we talked about. And both the understanding of the immediate health effects of having housing, especially during a time of pandemic when uh, it's impossible to stay home, stay safe, if there is no home in which to stay, um, or if that home is overcrowded, or um, in worst case scenarios, if one finds themselves in a homeless situation and congregate shelters. That, those immediate health effects, I think, have really been underscored by this pandemic and the long-term health effects uh, socially, financially, and physically of housing discrimination have also really come to a head in these uh, the first months of uh, 2020. It really has increased, I think, the attention both nationally and um, locally on the importance of housing and the need for better housing policies. Uh, it's housing as healthcare, housing is healthcare has been a rallying cry for a long time. And I think it is impossible for even um, the most extreme doubters to deny that that's absolutely the case in our current situation. I think that for the Vermont context, we ought to be rather proud that um, that understanding has been around for quite a while and has been significantly amplified by the nature of, of the pandemic that we're dealing with and um, some of the social social considerations that are really being amplified and brought to the fore. We, um, we should be proud that Vermont has rallied a incredible amount of the federal CARES Act uh, monies to go towards housing related elements. We have probably, I think in my research, the most robust rental assistance and mortgage assistance program in the country um, to make sure that people um, who have lost jobs or have uh, seen reduced hours or otherwise been financially stressed by the COVID-19 response have been able to avoid evictions, um, to be able to stay in their homes if they own their homes, and also to support many of the mom and pop landlords who also rely on rental income in order to maintain healthy rental units. Uh, we also, for a time, actually temporarily halted homelessness. Um, we were able to uh, garner resources and uh, use infrastructures um, that were in place to move um, people out of congregate shelters, uh, to engage folks who were in encampments and to move them into um, hotels that were being underutilized for a number of reasons. And we're actually using coronavirus relief funds through the CARES Act and through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to uh, increase the robustness of that infrastructure so that we can hopefully avoid having a situation where people need to be in, in congregate shelters for more than a very temporary amount of time um, or out in encampments. And we um, were also utilizing these funds to increase the rehabilitation of vacant and blighted units throughout um, throughout our downtowns, and there will be more information on that coming through our department in the in the coming months. And while I think Vermont is doing a really great job of leveraging these resources for lasting change and not just temporary band-aids, uh, we know that they will dry up. And I think that one of the even more um, more lasting changes that we're noticing through COVID-19 and and frankly through um, just the nature of our political situation right now is that there's been a much greater engagement civically um, for people of all ages who I think previously are making decisions not necessarily based on the proximity to jobs, but with the enhanced ability to remote work, um, are choosing communities based on the community value more than their proximity to uh, a place of employment. And I think that as, um, as that, as those efforts continue to expand and as that infrastructure continues to improve, we're going to see 
changes in our uh, housing housing demand uh, in various places that otherwise might have been less desirable because of uh, their remoteness and their distance have now become even more desirable areas. And furthermore, uh, the ability of people to interact with their local and state government in a remote fashion has obviously changed tremendously since March. Um, everything from Montpelier um, down to local development review boards and select board meetings, uh, folks who otherwise wouldn't have been able to take the time to actually travel to a physical location have been able to um, join a go-to meeting webinar or a Zoom meeting or things like that and actually engage on, on, a, on a political level that I don't think was as easily available prior to the reaction to this pandemic. So with that, and I think that that is going to be one of the lasting issues that we see after, after we come back to a, to a new normal, after this um, situation subsides. And so I think with that, it's really the most pertinent time right now to be talking about how best to um, create plans and engage with, with our citizens and our localities um, at a time when there's going to be even more opportunities for engagement. So with that, I will um, turn it uh, back to Jacob for our next presenter. Sean, thank you. That was really an excellent overview. And I just uh, would remind participants that if they have questions, um, you're welcome to type those into the, the question section. And if you have a question for a particular person, um, just make sure that you, you indicate, um, indicate who you would like to answer your question. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Jake Hemrick. I'm a community planning and policy manager in the Department of Housing and Community Development working with Sean. I work in the small community planning and revitalization division, and we administer tools, training, grants, and incentives really to support thriving and walkable communities, and, and that's where we focus. And today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the state's designation program we administer. It includes three core designations, a downtown village center and new town center, and two add-on designations, uh, a growth center designation and a neighborhood development area designation. And so those add-on designations, if you picture the egg white uh, surrounding an egg yolk, that's kind of what we're talking about in the landscape. Now, these, these, all these designations really weren't created as a complete program, but they were established by the legislature over time to, to meet uh, specific needs and unique purposes. And the newest of the designations is the neighborhood development area designation. And that was uh, uh, established in statute in 2013. And of all of them, it is the, it's the most focused on easing regulatory barriers that make housing harder and more expensive to build in high amenity traditional neighborhoods, the, the kinds of places where there are jobs and libraries, stores, school, transit, sidewalks, water, wastewater infrastructure, where all those things are available. In other words, the most convenient and affordable places to live and consequently also the places where we can provide public services most efficiently from water to wastewater to student busing to um, uh, uh, to, um, to to garbage pickup so overall the neighborhood development area designation makes it easier to develop housing by recognizing communities that are planning and regulating for inclusive housing development and by extending benefits such as reduced fees, capital gains tax incentives, and exemptions from Act 250 for mixed income housing. And I'm not gonna go through all the, the requirements and benefits, which you can learn more about by going to our NDA webpage on accd.vermont.gov. But the piece of the process I wanna talk about today is the NDA regulatory review we do um, when we sit down with interested communities that are thinking about designating an area of their community as a neighborhood development area. And basically what we do is we evaluate provisions in local bylaws and plans to see if they welcome connected neighborhoods and diverse housing opportunities. And that might be, uh, include provisions like minimizing setbacks, allowing at least four dwelling units per acre, and providing complete streets that expand transportation choice. And although we've seen we've received interest from 30 communities in Vermont. Only nine communities have been able to be designated by the downtown board as NDAs, and two of those were project des designations that sunsetted after the construction of the project was complete. And, and so what we've learned staffing the program and reviewing local bylaws to verify if they welcome homes in connected neighborhoods is that really too many of our local bylaws don't welcome homes in smart places. To, uh, and, and they really make Vermont's historic settlement um, 
as a, uh, as a uh, pattern, an illegal pattern of development. It reflect mid-century auto-oriented, low-density suburban preferences from the 60s and 70s when bylaws were first adopted widely in Vermont. They include features that work against housing choice, transportation choice, and affordability in places with development and enabling infrastructure like water and sewer. Uh, they restrict density. They can require lot, large lot sizes and large setbacks. Uh, often there's many discretionary review processes for multifamily that makes it more easily to appeal those projects uh, to court. Uh, some, some bylaws in Vermont create single family only, only districts, mandate excessive parking and more. So these are some of the examples, legacy provisions we're seeing from uh, mid-century codes that continue on in, in our local bylaws today. And, 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 and then when we look statewide at the, the state of planning and land use, about 80% of the municipalities in Vermont plan and regulate land use through zoning bylaws. And although our regional plans and municipal plans are required to address housing needs, the actual implementation of those local regulation of those plans and local regulations um, can reveal some gaps. And so at DHCD, we realized we, we have to find ways to make it easier for communities uh, to reform their zoning if we're going to have the NDA be an effective platform to address housing needs, which we really think it can be a really effective platform to expand housing choice and opportunity. Uh, so we partnered um, with funding from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board and the Vermont Realtors Association and AARP Vermont with the Congress for New Urbanism. And, and we worked to develop a new guide, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold this up uh, if I can get my camera right, called Enabling Better Places, a Zoning Guide for Vermont Neighborhoods. And this guide is all about making the biggest little change, the, the, uh, the, a small change that can have the biggest in, impact in your community. And it's gonna fe you're gonna see it featured in the toolkit that Leslie will explain after me. Overall, this guide recommends incremental changes to bylaws and sample languages for local boards and commissions to consider. And I'd encourage you to use this guide to learn about techniques that allow a wider range of housing and open conversations about helping address the mismatch that Sean talked about between Vermont's available homes and the changing needs of Vermonters. Last winter, the department also opened a legis legislative reform conversation, looking at some common barriers in, uh, that make housing uh, uh, less affordable. Like, uh, and, and we looked at things like, what can we do to build awareness around areas that can or cannot be served by municipal water and sewer? Uh, what about requiring more land uh, area per unit in, um, uh, in those areas? And how does that add to housing costs? Or what does it mean when we only allow multifamily in very limited areas of municipalities? And, and what are the impacts on, does that have on uh, creating socio socioeconomically diverse places? Um, so those are those, uh, some things we began to talk about. And this conversation led to the unanimous passage of a bill, S-237, by Vermont Senate. And mirrors important reforms where housing is becoming increasingly out of reach, um, even for full-time workers. And it's now, go it's now going to be going to the House in, in, in the coming session that will be starting next week. What we've learned, and what I know being in a local planning office, is that local advocates can just have a tremendous difference. Municipal leaders, um, and that doesn't mean that you have to be a municipal official, you can just be an active and engaged citizen, can help make regular regulatory change to welcome homes and expand opportunity a priority by taking a hard look at what's limiting housing starts and convenient, desirable, and affordable places to live in. And so that's where I, I think uh, learning more about uh, housing committees is such a valuable a valuable thing, and I hope you'll use some of the tools that we offer here in DHCD, uh, the Neighborhood Development Area, and the new Enabling Better Places, our zoning guide, um, to help lead some of those efforts. So I'm going to hand this off to Jess Hyman. Right. Th thank you, Jake. So I'm Jess Hyman from the Fair Housing Project of CBOEO, the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. And we work to end housing discrimination here in Vermont. And together with a network of partners, including the folks at Vermont Legal Aid and the Human Rights Commission and many others, uh, we do education and outreach uh, related to fair housing rights and responsibilities. And we also coordinate the uh, uh, Thriving Communities Initiative, which is a statewide partnership that seeks to raise awareness about inclusive affordable housing. So housing committees. Uh, 
very exciting topic. Uh, you know, as you heard from uh, from Sean and and Jake, there's an incredible role that uh, for people to play at a local level in helping meet local housing needs. And this uh, housing committees are a great community-based approach and also an opportunity for residents to have a voice in their housing policy. Um, and especially now, housing committees can help promote housing equity and opportunity for all Vermonters, especially those who may face discrimination based on their color, religion, disability, sexual orientation, age, or any of the other groups protected under state and federal health federal fair housing law. Um, so housing committees can play a really important role in influencing local planning and pol policy and benefit communities of any size, big or small, um, as evidenced by the many communities with housing committees all over the state. Uh, we did a survey a year or so ago and found that there are about 20 uh, established housing committees already in existence. And at that point, there were another six or seven in development. And we also heard that there were more than 30 towns and cities who were, uh, were interested in forming housing committees. So there's a lot of work already happening and, and, and a lot more to do. Um, and these committees have had a lot of successes and we'll hear from some, some housing committee members in just a few moments. So what can a housing committee look like? So these committees can, can really range from formal municipal committees to informal resident discussion groups and really everything in between. Um, so for example, uh, both Norwich and Shelburne have subcommittees of, of the planning commissions. Uh, South Burlington has a, an affordable housing committee that advises the city council. Windsor has an advisory committee and Manchester has an ad hoc group that shifts and changes depending on the needs of the town. Um, and so it's really, that's a really important thing to remember that a housing committee can change, that it may be formed for a specific purpose. And as those needs are met, met questions are answered, it can, can shift, shift its structure over, over time. Um, and housing committees, or specifically housing commissions, are actually included in our Vermont state statutes. Uh, if you really want to know which one, it's 924 VSA 4433 under advisory commissions and committees, if you'd like to look that up. Um, and so these state statutes outline the powers and duties of housing commissions, and, and those would be formal commissions with responsibilities as outlined by legislative bodies. Uh, and there's a whole slew of things that housing committees can do. And these can be from you know, formally commission committees or ad, ad, hoc, ad hoc groups. So for example, a housing committee can compile a housing needs assessment and identify gaps in availability and affordability. They can review the housing section of the town plan uh, or zoning ordinances, building codes. They can look at the DRB process. Uh, they can pr propose zoning and development regulation changes with an eye towards increased affordable housing. So things like inclusionary, inclusionary zoning, um, accessory dwelling zoning, uh, looking at Airbnbs and other short-term rentals. Uh, we're looking at accessibility opportunities for rehab and older units. Uh, housing committees can establish trust funds. Um, they can follow local, members can follow local developments and provide memos or testimony for um, local processes. Um, they can also collaborate with nonprofit and for-profit developers or builders with the goal of meeting local housing needs. Um, they can also do a, a local, local assessments of fair housing and look for any structural inequities or systemic racism. Um, and also, housing committees can play a really important role in building community understanding of what constitutes affordability and what contributes to that affordability. So changing the public will around affordable housing and really showing the relationship between affordability, equity, and, and economic vibrancy can be a really important role for these housing committees. And it can allow housing communities to do some fun stuff like outreach events or story sharing and really finding ways to engage residents in telling the story of our communities and how housing, especially inclusive affordable housing, plays an important role in that. Um, so let's see, we'll, a little later we'll talk about tools to help, to help get housing committees started and data resources to support housing committees. But now we want to hear from the folks who are really doing the work. Um, so we have representatives from uh, five different housing committees here today. Um, so first we'll hear from 
from uh, Pam Brannigan from, Shel from Shelburne and Darren Schibler from Essex. And they will, will tell us, uh, or so please tell us what led to the formation of your committee and be sure to include uh, what year your committee was formed and whether it's a formal town committee or an ad hoc, ad hoc group. So Pam and Darren, why don't you pop onto the screen and Pam, we'll start with you, thank you. Need to unmute. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm Pam Brangen, and I live in the town of Shelburne. Uh, we have uh, had a housing subcommittee of the Planning Commission uh, since uh, April of 2016, um, and we were. Uh, I think the reason that our committee was formed was um, actually we had a um, a planning commission, uh, a member of the planning commission. I think he was the chair. And uh, he really recognized the need um, of housing and um, making sure that uh, Shelburne was addressing the, the needs of its residents. And as he was stepping off of the committee, uh, the planning commission, he kind of proposed the idea of creating this subcommittee, um, knowing that he was probably going to be um, appointed to it, which he was. Um, so there was a small group of us that started in 2016 and our um, original or the starting um, function of this committee was basically data collection. We were asked to um, compile and collate um, and analyze information on the number of houses, number of bedrooms per house, location of housing, um, all sorts of housing statistics uh, that we basically um, grabbed from all different resources uh, um, from around the, the state agencies, as well as from census data. And we compiled it all into um, a housing booklet uh, that we published uh, for the committees in town to use. And it's available also for residents. It's um, on the town website. Um, and so we we compiled that housing booklet in our first year year and a half of existence and so that was kind of why we were created thank you very much pam darren hi uh, thanks for having me and i'll talk a little bit about how things got started in essex and they we still don't actually have an appointed housing commission we've created the the structure for it but we're still waiting for interviews to be completed. So it's very fresh. And what started our process was just realizing a lot of what um, the folks on this webinar have already talked about, just that housing is so important for the vitality of a community and that the situation is not great in Vermont and even in um, you know, places in Essex. So we were hearing anecdotes from community members that you know they can't find housing, they can't find anything affordable or something that fits their family size. Uh, we heard from employers that they can't um, place their workers locally because there's just not enough housing. And we also know that there is some naturally affordable housing where it's you know, available at a reasonably affordable rate, but it's already getting snatched up you know, with the hot housing market. So you know, with all of this, uh, we at Essex Junction actually partnered with housing data or with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency to update housingdata.org with, uh, with a new skin basically and really pull together a lot of the data from the Census Bureau and other state agencies um, to make it more available and easy to use. So that started our process of creating a housing needs assessment, which was done by staff. Um, and it was done with a coordinated approach between our town and village, knowing that we had this merger effort going on and that the last time we looked at housing, which was uh, back in 1990, we had an affordable housing task report. It was also joined, and we had to think about this in a regional way. It wasn't just one community being able to fix all of its housing problems. It's trying to look at this systemically. So with all of that um, partnership and assistance and um, just energy around housing, we were able to get that housing needs assessment done. Uh, one of the first recommendations was to form a housing commission, and that's where we stand today. Great. Thank you, Darren. So now we'd like to invite Janet Hurley from Manchester and Heather Carrington from Winooski to join, to join us on screen. Great. Welcome. So Janet and Heather, 
Will you please tell us what your what activities your committees have been doing um, and what your accomplishments have been? And we'll start with Janet and then move to Heather. Oh, and then make sure to uh, start off with the year you were established and your structure so that the audience can can see the diversity of different different types of groups. Thank you. Sure. Um, can I have screen sharing? Capability? You have it. I do. Mm -hmm. uh, the little window is not there. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Show screen. No, that's not it. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess. We have your slides, Janet. It's just not in the slideshow format. Oh, okay. Okay, let me do that then. So you can see this? I okay, have, so, yeah. Okay, so providing a housing stock that meets the needs of the town's workforce has long been a particular challenge in Manchester. The town has taken an ad hoc approach, as Jess mentioned, through the years conducting grant-funded studies guided by the Planning Commission or a, an ad hoc housing committee. Uh, in 1989, a housing action plan led to planned affordable residential development regulations, which led to affordable housing development in the town. Uh, in, in 2006, a residential build-out analysis revealed that 85% of potential residential development fell within the town's rural areas, not necessarily in line with town planning goals nor affordable housing goals. In 2016, the Northshire Economic Development St Strategy, also called NEDS, was conducted and that galvanized the town of Manchester to refocus on providing workforce housing. It led to comprehensive rezoning in 2018, which led to an NDA designation in our downtown. In reasserting the importance of a pedestrian oriented vibrant downtown, the NEDS led to the appointment of a downtown housing steering committee um i believe that was in 2019 um it might have been late 2018 actually um and that downtown downtown housing steering committee has guided a downtown mixed use market study and currently a site specific feasibility analysis in the downtown for mixed use development that includes significant housing This graphic from the 2016 NEDS uh, very effectively illustrates the workforce housing potential that we have in Manchester. Um, the, with a preponderance of the town's workforce residing out of the area. And basically the town's goal is, has been in the last few years now to increase the green. <laughs> So to, to provide more workforce housing that would allow a significant portion of this um, workforce that isn't living in the area to move to Manchester. Um, and this last, um, this, this last effort um, that we've been uh, conducting under the uh, guidance of the Downtown Housing Steering Committee, it has been this two-phase downtown mixed-use study. And last year, um, the, uh, we conducted, with Doug Kennedy's help, a market analysis for um, housing mixed with other uses in the downtown. And that led to the second phase in which we have um, contracted with White and Burke to um, identify two sites within our downtown. Um, one happens to be right here and another, um, this uh, vacant space in front of our new Hampton Inn in the downtown. Oh, excuse um, me, Janet, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't see the large version of, of the slides. Are you able to click on the one that you're talking about so it shows up in the main screen? Oh, I'm I'm seeing just the slide that I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I don't. 
I don't know. Oh, that's, that's okay. Can, can, okay. Please, please continue. <laughs> People can ask uh, maybe some specific questions that I can help elucidate that. But the the point of this um, this last phase, anyway, is to develop pro formas for these two sites in our downtown that would allow us to assess whether the 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 comprehensive zoning changes that we made, the designation of the NDA are enough to make um, a mixed use development in our downtown feasible. Um, and that, that kind of mixed use development that has substantial housing as part of it is, has really been seen in the last few years after that NEDS um, project as key to um, a vibrant and livable downtown. So, if um, if this study shows that this just is not feasible in in downtown Manchester under the current rubric, what can the town do to make it feasible? Um, so that's where we are um, in our sort of evolving ad hoc approach. Great. Thank you very much, Janet. Heather. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here and thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Heather Carrington. I am the Community and Economic Development Officer for the City of Winooski. And in that role, um, I was the staff person who developed the structure, wrote the charter, and onboarded the members of our existing housing commission. And I continue to serve as the staff liaison to that commission and facilitate their work. Our housing commission was formed in 2017, and that was as a direct response to a 2016 housing needs assessment that we had done. It was one of the recommendations in that housing needs assessment. Um, our commission is a formal commission. It has a charter. It serves um, city council directly as an advisory board on housing policy. It's made up of five regular members and two alternates that are all appointed by our city council. Um, and over and when we did the outreach, um, we did really targeted outreach to get the uh, commission that we have. Um, we were thinking about how complex housing issues are and how interrelated with a wide variety of different issues. So we really tried to stack that commission with some expertise. So we have on our commission someone from Vermont Housing Finance Agency, from a, someone from the Winooski Housing Authority. Um, considering our makeup, having um, a lot of foreign-born residents, I think it's 18% of our population, um, we did direct outreach to have someone from USCRI, formerly known as Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program, one of their housing managers um, on that board. We have the superintendent of schools um, and we have a landlord and a renter. Uh, we have a realtor, so they can all bring different perspectives to that body and I found it to be incredibly helpful to our commission's work. So in the last three years since they started in August of 2017, the Housing Commission, and I'm just gonna run through a bulleted list because it's a lot to cover in three minutes. So. Um, they performed a really deep dive into housing data and did an analysis of what the existing conditions are in the housing in Winooski. One of the reasons for that is because there were a lot of um, commonly held assumptions about what the needs were in Winooski that turned out to be patently false based on the data. Um, so we really needed to strongly identify what was on the ground and what were the problems that we were actually trying to solve. Um, after that, they set housing policy goals for the city and those, you know, there I think there are seven different policy goals, but those are things like encouraging ongoing development of affordable housing, fostering a mix of different types of housing to meet different needs, um, promoting quality housing, um, and protecting current residents from displacement as just an example of some of those. We went on to identify gaps in the housing in Winooski um, and set affordability targets, particularly for rental housing being developed in Winooski, because that we're largely a built out city and that is primarily what we're seeing in terms of new development. So we found that in Winooski, because we have a very high percentage actually of big A affordable housing, you know, project based housing. Um, we had a gap actually in the 80 to 100 percent area median income where there just was a much smaller share of the market that was available for families that would be considered workforce housing. 
Um, the commission's work was then used as the basis for the housing chapter of our 2019 um, Winooski planning, um, I'm sorry, Winooski master plan. We established a housing trust fund. Uh, we monitor and report to city council on rental pricing in Winooski using our rental registry. Um, we send out an annual survey to that rental registry, asking them to voluntarily give us what the rental pricing is, um, which is a, has allowed us to have really, really accurate information, which has been very helpful. Um, we monitor incoming housing development compared with the housing targets that we had set. We have supported the planning commission with data analysis and recommendations for changes to zoning to promote affordable housing. Most recently, that was looking at the impact of required parking minimums um, on the availability, on, on the affordability of housing. We hosted a housing policy summit in the fall of 2018, where we had um, partners, partners with expertise come in and talk to us about some of the policies that we were looking at and some of the implications of those policies and you know, intricacies of how to do those right. Uh, the Housing Commission reviews our annual gentrification monitoring report, which I prepare in January of every year, um, really monitoring eight indicators of uh, potential gentrification to see where we stand with that as an early warning system. Um, so we'll know if we are in fact gentrifying. And currently, the Housing Commission is looking at housing stability indicators in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think that covers it. And I think it really aligns with what Jess has said are the roles that a Housing Commission can play. I think you can walk down that bulleted list and see that that's precisely what we're doing. So thanks for letting me tell you about us. Great. Thank you very much, Heather. So now I'd like to invite Pam and Darren uh, to come back. Uh, on screen, and we'll, if, if all four of our if all, of our housing committee representatives could join us, um, and it's been great to hear about the different structures and compositions of your committees and commissions and groups, um, and and all these great examples of activities that other towns can incorporate into their into their work. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so now I'd like to ask each of you quickly just to say what's one piece of advice that you have for other uh, towns and groups looking to start housing committees? What's been helpful to you? Uh, what's been an effective strategy? What have been some good resources? What are your lessons learned? So if you could each share one, one, uh, one learning with the group and we'll go in the, in, the in the same order. So we'll start with Pam and then Darren and then Janet and then Heather. Thank you. Hi Jess, thank you. Um, so just one lesson learned, that's kind of tough. <laughs> Um, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how our committee in our most recent project uh, that we've worked on has been uh, doing a, a, some modifications to the zoning uh, for accessory dwelling units in town. And um, we have learned the benefit of Front Porch Forum to engage our community. Um, we, we wanted, well, we, we have developed a, a website a page off of the town website that talks about the accessory dwelling units um, and we offer to our community sort of a, a little cheat sheet on how to go about it but we reached out to the community through front porch forum to ask folks uh, for their anyone who already has an accessory dwelling unit or is considering doing one um, if they would be willing to share their story so we've incorporated um, some of our local residents' um, stories on why they use the accessory dwelling unit um, option for increasing housing um, at, right on our website. So I feel like Front Porch Forum is a great um, avenue to engage the community and it's a really a good way to uh, kind of bring housing issues to, to everyone in town. Thank you, Pam. Darren. Thanks, Jess. Um, I realized I didn't actually give much information about the structure of Essex's Housing Commission, even though it's fairly new, um, but it really is modeled after the uh, city of Winooski's approach of trying to make a standing commission that is looking at all of these different factors that affect housing and affordability and so on. Um, so we envision them looking at um, bylaws, partnering with developers, pursuing grants, and just engaging the community. And that's something that I think is going to become really important because one of the things we've seen in Essex, and this is going into my tips is that every time a development comes through and there's any mention of any sort of affordable housing component there's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to 
oh, well, what's that going to look like? Is that going to affect the neighborhood? And people just sort of have that worry of well, what does that even mean? And having people, uh, particularly on your housing commission or just other folks in the community being aware of that and saying, no, we need this housing. These are the people who are running your garbage trucks and teaching in your schools. And those are the people that are going to be in this housing. Um, and, you know, the people who need it, who are, you know, homeless or struggling with any sort of um, housing security issue um, need a place to stay. And this can provide that. So having those advocates who not only are in the weeds, looking at the data, trying to monitor the situation in your community, but also advocating and make, creating those conversations um, at the select board, the planning commission, and you know, outside of municipal you know, venues is really important. And I think will sort of change the perception of what housing affordability means in Vermont. Great, thank you very much, Darren. Janet. So I guess um, what I would say as a, you know, from a town perspective that's in, not in Chittenden County, um, and a smaller, um, you know, with smaller or no staff, that one of the most important tools that municipalities in Vermont have is the Municipal Planning Grant Program. And in the last four years, we have attained a Municipal Planning Grant for every step of this um, process that I described earlier. And um, if if you're in a town that doesn't have staff that can write uh, grant proposals to the Municipal Planning Grant Program, you know, you should get the help of your Regional Planning Commission to do that for you. Um, but it's been an essential tool in, in our most recent, actually, and even starting probably in 1989, I would wager that the everything that the town of Manchester has done um, for in terms of housing has been grant funded and um, I guess that's what I would say from our perspective. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah, that funding piece is really important. And Heather. Yeah, I'm going to um, give you three, but I'm only going to name the first two and then explain the third. Um, use a data-driven approach. It's been absolutely essential to what we've been doing. Um, bring experts to the table, and that doesn't have to happen the way that we set up our commission. Bring them in to discuss policy issues. Um, we've done that. No one's gonna know, no one's gonna be an expert on all of this. So it's really essential to have those voices come in so you're not reinventing the wheel. And the third one that I'm gonna talk about just a little bit is um, define terms early and often. So people have a lot of assumptions about what affordable housing is. And so really differentiating, are you talking big A affordable, little a affordable? What are the income brackets? What does low income look like? What is that dollar number? Um, I, I, I've talked to people who were surprised to find that they are low income. You know, they had it, that's other people, you know? So I think continuing to define terms matters a lot. And I'll give you one anecdote. Um, when our housing commission was presenting to city council, one of our goals was to improve quality of housing. And we were getting this amazing amount of pushback from city council and couldn't understand why. But what we were talking about was health and safety and durability. And what they were hearing was quartz countertops and waterfall shower heads. So they were thinking that we were promoting gentrification in some way. So by not defining that term, we had a really strange interaction that never needed to happen. And I think it's a huge opportunity by defining those terms, um, defining those numbers to really educate the community on what we're talking about. Great, thank you, Heather. Yeah, so that's, what a great um, what, volume of, of advice here, everything from a whole community approach to looking at regional and state resources, you know, defining your terms and setting clear goals. I mean, it's really good advice for other groups looking to start. And we'll, we'll, we'll be hearing more from our housing, our housing committee friends during the, during the Q&A. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for sharing your experiences and, and, and the activities from your communities. Uh, so next we'll hear from Leslie. We'll talk about some tools to, to help housing committees. Thank you. Oh, I'm super excited um, 
to show you um, a little bit um, about what may help support housing committees and all the important work that you just heard about. Um, I am lucky enough to be on two housing committees right now in South Burlington and Winooski, and then I also get to, um, to work on community relations and research at Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And that means that um, I work with a small but mighty team that runs that Vermont Housing Data website. And I'm gonna show you some tools in that site that, um, that I hope will support the work of um, local advocates and housing committees in their various formats. So I'm gonna show you my screen um, because this is, this is the best way to um, experience, I think, these tools. Um, we are lucky enough to have the URL housingdata.org for our small state of Vermont, um, but this is where it happens um, in terms of the tools that I wanna share with you today. Uh, this, this website's run by Vermont Housing Finance Agency, but, um, the toolbox that I'm going to show you today is a is a um, a collaborative effort on the part of um, CVOEO's Driving Communities Project um, and the Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development, um, in particular Jacob Hemrick and Jess Hyman and myself work together to and Sean Gilpin to work together to create this toolbox. So um, I am just gonna click on in and show you a little bit about what the toolbox looks like. It has been recently improved to be vastly more rich with um, information and tools about, um, about housing in local communities in Vermont and about best practices and resources for housing committees and other residents and um, in communities to find out information and, um, and how to access resources. So um, the Housing Ready Toolbox um, is divided into four main areas. There is a first steps area that I encourage you to look through at your convenience. Um, there's um, information just about getting started in terms of thinking about housing in your community, um, how to think about somehow assessing your housing needs if they haven't been done recently, and about your municipal plan, and about how to create a housing committee if you don't already have one and you're looking to get started. There are just um, examples and um, and whatever information that we could find that we thought would be helpful to uh, towns that are just starting out. And the Housing 101 area is the second major area of this toolbox. And that's um, that has a lot of good um, general information about learning the housing, um, some of the housing concepts, if they are new to you or some members of a committee that you're working on. This can be a place for people to get familiar with some terms that are that are really helpful when you're thinking about the housing in your area. Um, I know we go we use these um, assessing affordability tools quite a bit um, on the committees that I'm on. Um, this table is um, something that is just a lot of numbers, but what it what it's helpful um, for is kind is specifically understanding what it means to be a median income household in a particular part of the state. What does that mean in terms of income and in terms of the rent and likely the purchase price that the maximum purchase price that's affordable at that particular income level. So this this weird nerdy chart is just um, is actually pretty useful when you're trying on for size different housing policies and especially defining housing affordability. Does that mean that it's housing affordable at the 80% of area median income level? Does that mean it's housing affordable at the 100% of area median income level? If this is a this chart lets you see, you know, what home prices are we talking about if that's our um, our metric for housing affordability. So I just uh, encourage you to to poke around in here and um, see if there is something that helps you as you do your work. And if there's other tools that you don't see in here, we really want this to be a, um, a toolbox that has all the tools um, to the extent that they are 
um, they are available at, a, at the statewide level for multiple communities, we want this to be a toolbox that you can go to and pull out the, um, the information or tool that you need. So um, this, the third part of this toolbox is, um, is about housing committees. And so it gives you some more um, information about how to get started, summarizes some of the concepts that have already been described here today um, about what your, what your committee can look like, um, how to get started, um, and gives you a link to some uh, information about some existing committees, some of them that we've heard from today. Um, and then a few others, um, and because there's really no substitute from learning from somebody who has done um, done the kind of um, the kind of work that you're about to start. Um, the th the last part of this toolbox is a just a compendium of tools and resources, including some links to um, another major area of this housing data website which is the community profiles area. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard me talk about this already, but these, um, these, these profiles in here really give you some quick data. Um, this, this place in particular, you can just really search on any community in the state and, um, and find out some quick information about how many people live there, um, um, you know, how many people are homeless in that region? What's the median income? How many people are already spending more than 50% of their income for, um, for housing? Um, and then a wealth of other metrics. Um, but each of these areas has quite a few indica indicators about housing needs. Um, so explore that when you can. Um, it's all, as I mentioned, learning from what we've done in other towns is so helpful. And we've tried to um, create a, a, a catalog of some of the housing needs assessments that have been done in other parts of the state. It's a little hard to maintain, but, um, but as we find out about them, we've tried to, we try to update the links here on this site. But if you were looking for, um, uh, for if you want to look at what Darren was describing in terms of the housing needs assessment that that they did in Essex to help get uh, help get their housing commission um, initiated, uh, here's a link right to the right to that report. Um, yeah, uh, this housing needs assessment guide can be a really great way of helping you identify what kinds of information makes sense to look at in your community. The community profiles is a big compendium of information, but this helps a community narrow um, the questions, kind of hone in on the questions that are most important for that community and then guide your data gathering if you're deciding, if you decide to go ahead and do a housing needs assessment. And then the regulatory tools that we've been hearing um, a little bit about today, the Zoning for Great Neighborhoods Guide that Jacob Told us, um, told us about uh, can be accessed here um, and additional tools um, from DHCD, super important and helpful. Um, there's a, a big table here of the regulatory tools that we have heard about um, other, lo other lo localities. Um, um, and we've included some examples, links to examples of other towns. Some of them are in Vermont. Sometimes um, there aren't any Vermont examples yet of using some of these tools to promote housing affordability. But um, as, as we learn about uh, where these are being implemented, we try to include um, links and descriptions of the, of the tools here. Let's see. Um, and I will let you poke through the rest of these as, on, on your own is really the best way to explore this resource. Um, a couple of other uh, ways to support the work of your housing committees is also to, um, to sign up for the uh, Thriving Communities um, blog post. And um, there is a, a link to that on, in the toolbox. Um, also, VHFA News Blog is a great way to find out what's going on in the state and in um, and sometimes at the local level. 
Um, technical assistance is another option for a local, a local community um, that wants to, um, that needs some some one-on-one -on -one guidance about how to move forward. Technical assistance is available through Jess at CBOEO or through VHFA. Um, our community relations department can, is also happy to help um, with some one-on-one -on -one, um, um, discussions with your housing committee or a group of local officials, whatever, whatever, whatever you're in need of. Uh, your regional planning, I'm going to show you, I want to show you that you don't have to remember all these things. These are all, all the things I'm telling you about are somewhere in this toolbox, this additional tools area of the, um, of the data site has uh, links to the different um, tools that I've been mentioning in the last couple of minutes. So your regional planning commissions are super, super helpful um, in terms of um, finding out what your what other communities in your region are doing, and they can also be a source of technical assistance for you. So there's a if you there's a link here to um, to the VAPTA site that lets you know what regional regional planning commission um, is uh, is is in effect in your part of the state, and um, contacting their housing uh, their housing staff person is a great um, is a great resource. Another option for um, for actually funding some of your startup if you are um, looking to form a housing committee or um, looking at a specific issue is to explore the um, the small grants for smart growth um, option that is run by the Vermont Natural Resources Council. And so there's a link to that here too, as well as the municipal planning grant that we heard about earlier today. So, um, so those are a few tools that, um, that I hope you find useful. I'm happy to answer questions um, at any point about this. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. At the work of VHFA and making data accessible and easy to, uh, easy to find and use has been so helpful for so many communities. And, and I think one thing that Heather said that really stood out to me is the ground the conversation in data and definitions. And, uh, and the tools that uh, you and your team and, and colleagues have created um, help make those conversations uh, so much so much easier. And, and I think there, uh, you mentioned the blog, and I know we, we at DHCD really enjoy um, seeing the blog post from um, Mia Watson. And I need to give a shout out to, to uh, Faith Inglesrud, who's on the call, who is the project manager for Zoning for Great Neighborhoods. Um, I know we had a, a few miscommunications about using the chat function um, on there. It, it appears that the chat function is something for us and not for general attendees, but um, but I noticed many of you do introduce yourself in the question section. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to jump in there and uh, and put them in. If I could ask the, uh, the panelists to come back on the screen, um, we, can, we can go through a few questions that have been posted. And um, and one of the one of the questions is not directed to anybody in particular, but uh, it's about uh, energy efficiency and affordable housing. And uh, and to what extent is affordable housing considering uh, net zero and renewables in their planning? Is that a is that a big factor? Um, but and it seems like there's a, a kind of a natural tension there where you're having more upfront capital costs with uh, some energy efficiencies. Um, but lower operational costs over the over the life of the um, over the life of the housing. Have any of you been um, digging into that 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 area? We in Manchester we haven't dug into that, but when we did our comprehensive rezoning, we um, allowed for unlimited residential density for net zero um, development and defining net zero as um, in producing this um, on an annual basis, producing the same amount of energy that is used on the site. Um, so, so we and nobody has made use of that yet. It's it's a brand new provision, but but we we added that as part of our our comprehensive rezoning. In um, Winooski, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Darren. Okay, I'll, I'll say what we do in Winooski right now. Um, we have form-based code um, in our gate, major gateways in our city. And so as part of that, 
We have a bonus story that's allowable for people who exceed energy standards. Um, we don't specify net zero. Um, and we've had a lot of people take us up on that one because I think actually our energy standards are a little bit too low. So more to come on that, we'll see. And uh, I would say we haven't in Essex looked at our energy efficiency regulations for a long time. We do have a bonus for density for energy efficient design, but it's way outdated and no one has ever taken advantage of it. I would say the most effective way to sort of pair energy efficiency and affordability is to do uh, the button up Vermont campaigns and have an energy committee that's active and working on that, which we do thankfully in Essex, and they kind of have the energy on their own to make a lot of that happen. Uh, Efficiency Vermont has some amazingly, you know, like it's too good to be true incentives for weatherization and um, other sort of smaller bits and, you know, doing new appliances or even doing solar. So I would say, you know, push hard on that and make the case that it's not just about doing something, you know, good for the planet. It's really saving you a lot of money. We just had our house weatherized and found out when we had an audit done that it, there was no insulation in it and it had been built in the 50s. So it's been there for half a, half a century, you know, not insulated. There's a lot more houses like that out there, I'm sure. Great. And scanning through um well i'm I'm curious all of you are communities that have it seems that have had or um or currently have a neighborhood development area designation um and so it seems you're making investments in in uh expanding access to your regulations um and it seems that you're also communities that have a lot of development pressure as well do you think um a housing committee might look different in a community that uh, doesn't have quite as much development pr pressure or where there's a need uh, as great a need in communities like that i think communities have such very different circumstances that set them up to uh, either have development pressure or not so um in the recent convening, well, actually a year ago, um, CCRPC, um, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, um, was convening all of the housing commissions in Chittenden County. And just, it never occurred to me that there were communities in Chittenden County that didn't have um, municipal sewer. And so that, you know, that be such a completely different set of circumstances that's causing people not to be able to um, develop in communities. So I do think housing commissions, you know, really need to look at what the local circumstances are and then work to those to ameliorate those issues. So, you know, I, I don't know that a housing commission can set up a municipal sewage system, um, but they can certainly advocate. And, and so I think it's going to look very, very different depending on what municipality you're in. I would second that and say, you know, one of the things even that we look at in Essex is supporting the infrastructure for growth, regardless of how it happens, uh, as a way to improve affordability. Because if you, the typical approach has been put the uh, cost of developing infrastructure, streets, sewer, water lines on developers. And if the municipality is willing to take that over and able to make that work, whether it's through, you know, simple um funding through the um, existing user fees or maybe doing a TIF district or whatever that looks like uh, or getting grants that makes a huge difference you know maybe not uh enough to solve your affordable housing problem but it, it gets you those extra you know units or that extra affordability that wouldn't otherwise be there mm -hmm. anyone else well, we, we don't have many questions coming in, but I, I will ask one more. And uh, and I think all of you alluded this a little bit about how um, there can be myths or misunderstandings that are in the community. Uh, and, and when you're talking about um, new housing and increasing affordability, and uh, when you're hearing those conversations happen, happen or those misunderstandings, um, what uh, beyond, uh, you know, Grounding and definition, which I think is amazing. That's a great tip I, that really sticks with me. Uh, and getting data. Are there other ways, other tactics you use, have used, uh, or communications tools to kind of change the conversation? Um, well, I'll just 
plug again, like Front Porch Forum and 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 your town website. You know, just having um, sort of a page dedicated to uh, you know explaining those definitions um, or talking about a certain uh, zoning change, explaining it to the community as best you can um, to sort of bring it to them as opposed to letting them come you know at to a meeting and be unhappy with you know a change or a proposed development um i also think that um it it's good for a housing committee to attend uh drb meetings um and uh planning commission meetings to sort of uh be there to be proponents of a development that may be under scrutiny uh or that you know a community a part of the part of the town may be against because of uh, what they're afraid of, you know, what might what might happen if that development, that large development goes in. Um, I think having um, more than just the staff be there to support it, it's great to have the, you know, a housing committee member or members be there to support and to offer how it, it addresses the issues in town. Well, this actually, this feeds into a question we received from Emily Hyman. She said, what words of wisdom do you have for communities with a strong anti-growth and what mm -hmm. about protecting the people who live here sentiment among residents? It's funny, I actually just talked to a resident yesterday about that exact sentiment of, you know, this neighbor of mine is, you know, it was a zoning violation, but it led to this conversation around well, they're adding all of these, you know, rooms and, these people are coming in and they're creating all these problems in our neighborhood. And by the end of our conversation, after I talked about, well, yeah, there's this big housing problem and that's creating these pressures and we're trying to do something about it, but how managing change in any neighborhood is difficult. And um, I brought it back to, you know, we're trying to make sure there's room for everybody here in a way that's gonna work for everybody. And that can be, you know, your relative or you know, your friend who's looking to, moved to the area um, and it's not just those people um, and really trying to make them help them understand that you know we're all in this together and it's not necessarily going to completely change the character of their neighborhood or you know the increased traffic or all these things it's really about making the um, housing you know it's there in a, a less in your face way um, and that's really what our municipality is trying to do and bring them in as a partner to that and say, hey, if you want to be involved in this and want to talk about it, come to our meetings, come to our planning meetings, not just our development review board meetings, or don't just talk to us about violations, get involved in the process. Yeah. I think there's something underlying what Darren has said a couple of times throughout this that speaks to the previous question as well, which is you've spoken about um, putting a face to people. So it's not, you know, you specifically said these are nurses, these are teachers, these are the people we need in our community. That's who falls in this income bracket. And I think that that's incredibly useful for people to start to understand, you know, these are the people, these are what they do. You know, do you want that in your community or do you want to exclude that from your community? And it makes a huge difference. Similar question relates to uh, how do you get people to see the future of the community and, and really understand the trends, maybe demographic trends, a community that's aging or a community that's not becoming affordable to uh, the firefighter or the, the teacher. Um, have any of you done any scenario-based training uh, as you're going through data? Uh, of if we continue on this trajectory, this might be our future? No. I don't think we need to. I think it's pretty apparent to folks. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a question from Paul. He says, I believe there's a strong need to focus on moderate income housing in Vermont, as many Vermonters may be making too much money to qualify as low income subsidized housing, but are still struggling with incomes at 50% or more of their income to rent a mortgage. Is there committee interest in more focus to help Vermonters at middle income levels so they can afford to stay in the Green Mountain State? Yes, absolutely, Manchester. Um, in fact, when we did that comprehensive rezoning, we um, provided a definition for workforce housing that, um, that included um, household incomes far in excess of what the federal definition for workforce housing is. Um, basically, 
to include people that to include households that are making up to um, 120 percent of area median income which gets you into the you know the low 100 uh, k range for a household because as our town manager liked to the, the the example he liked to use is that there are very few um teachers or police officers for instance that work in manchester that live in manchester because the housing stock that is available for that income range is is really slim and when it goes on the market it's gone like that um <clears throat> so so definitely and and that expanded definition of workforce was a, it was a really important part of our zoning rewrite Thanks, I'll just add to that um, that uh, in Essex we've made a couple of um, planning commission and BRB approvals that instead of going for that 80% AMI, which the developer said they can maybe get one unit out of that or wouldn't be able to do it at all, um, they said, well, if I did, you know, 100% median income, I could get more units, and that was seen as a plus for the planning commission. Um, so just be flexible and you know what you're looking at and respond to the needs and don't don't forget about the below 100 percent yeah great tips thanks darren and we're coming up almost on two o'clock but there's one one question about involving if there are any ideas about involving landlords especially small landlords as part of your housing program i'm happy to speak to what we do in winooski um I think it's really a huge part of our success that we have a rental registry in our community. Um, so we do direct outreach. Um, there was already an annual letter going out reminding people um, to pay their rental registry fees uh, and that there were inspections coming, et cetera. So I added a that was strictly voluntary. Can you report to us on what your rental pricing is per unit? Um, can you report to us what you would most like to see housing trust funds go to in, in terms of rehabilitation. And so we as a housing commission have used that information in helping to, uh, number one, provide really reliable uh, data. So while you have US census data that can have wide margins of error, we have um, the pricing in our community down to uh, at 95% confidence level, a 1.2% margin of error, which is 10 to $15 one way or the other. So when you go in with information like that from your community and, and involve your community in getting that to you, you then have so much more credibility. And then when you ask the landlords, what would you like the program funds to go to, you have much more likelihood of success. So that's one way that we've included landlords in the process. Great. Well, I'm just just doing a final scan through. I I, I think that there might have been a, a problem with Carl uh, uh, Bolin, who joined us, who is on the housing committee in Heinsberg, and might have had something to say, but I, I'm not seeing him jump in. So I I can't thank you enough. And if everybody else wants to, oh, there you are, Carl. Did you did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, if I could. Uh, I'm at the Heinsberg Affordable Housing Committee, and we I've been on the committee since 2006. Just a couple of points to pass on. I'm not sure the audience, but um, Congress was successful in getting inclusionary zoning into its bylaws, and Burlington has inclusionary zoning. It's one way to get some small market affordable units. The other thing that we're moving towards is connecting affordable housing to water and wastewater applications. Um, which is more effective if there is a limit on availability of water and wastewater, which in times of situation, some towns don't have. Education. The other thing I want to pass on is we write in and met with all the nonprofits, uh, Housing Vermont, um, the State Housing Authority, Sheffield Housing Trust, to figure out where we could fit into their plans and what we needed to sort of pull together whether it's land um, and advocacy to get a housing project in our community. And four years ago, we were successful in Street uh, being part of a 
connected to that, and I think people came to agree with that, you, you have to deal with the end of the situation. So those are just a couple of things. Uh, one other point, we've got energy efficiency. Hindberg has an energy committee. If your towns have an energy committee, it's a good way to partner on that dilemma of but also trying to work towards um, dealing with so there's just a couple of comments I thought I could just look past on. And thanks for having us. Thank you, Carl. You're a little you're a little garbled, but uh, great right. feedback on looking at inclusionary zoning, uh, inviting the affordable housing nonprofits to talk with your community, really looking at your water wastewater infrastructure and making sure you have the the capacity and working with an energy committee. If I if I followed all those things right. Um, well, it is five till, and I think we've we've covered a lot of great ground, and um, and have heard so many so many um, uh, really inspiring suggestions and things that you've done at the local level, uh, and learned a lot about uh, what's happening uh, statewide. Um, there is an evaluation form uh, in the uh, chat box that was sent out to everybody. It's the uh, HTTPS forms, and if you would like to evaluate this, um, please feel free to follow through on that link, and we may we may send that out as an email follow up as well. But I can't thank you enough, Janet, Darren, Heather, Pam, Carl, Jess, Leslie, Sean. This was a this was a really fun event, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend yourself. Bye-bye. Yeah.